All right, we'll go ahead and get started as folks continue to join. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We're live with Melissa Skulls Young and Jared Yates Sexton discussing The Hive. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. We are also in partnership with the Washington Literacy Center this evening. If you have a question for our speakers, use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll move to questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time to answer all of them. Additionally, we're glad to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To enable captions, click the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of the screen. And before we dive in, we do want to sincerely thank you for joining us and let you know about a special promotion offered by the Hive and the WLC this evening. The Shoe Hive in Old Town Alexandria will provide a coupon for $25 off a $100 purchase for anyone who attends this event. The coupon will be sent to your email following the, the discussion. Happy shopping, everyone. And now for the book. The Hive is a story of class in America and the fates of four sisters and their family business in a politically divided Midwestern town. After the sudden death of their patriarch, the surprising details of secession in his will are revealed and the mother's long-term affair surfaces as her apocalypse prepper training intensifies. Facing an economic recession and a new civil war amidst the backdrop of growing fear and resentment, the sisters unite in their struggle to save the family foundation they've built. Melissa Skulls Young is the author of the novels Flood and The Hive. She's a contributing editor for Fiction Writers Review and editor of two volumes of DC Women Writers, Grace in Darkness and Furious Gravity. Her work has appeared in The Atlantic, Washington Post, Plowshares, Narrative, Lit Hub, Poet Lore, and Poets and Writers Magazine. She was named a Breadloaf Camargo Fellow and a Quarry Farm Fellow at the Center for Mark Twain Studies. She is an Associate Professor in the Department of Literature at American University in Washington, D.C. And moderating this evening is Jared Yates Sexton, a political analyst, co-host of the Muckrake podcast, and the author of American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. On behalf of politics and prose, please join me in welcoming Melissa Skulls Young and Jared Yates Sexton. Thank you both. Uh, I just want to say first and foremost, uh, thank you to politics and prose for giving uh, Melissa and I this venue. I'm incredibly looking forward to this. Um, if you haven't read it already, right, The Hive is one of the best books uh, in, in recent memory. So I'm excited to talk about that. Uh, before we get into the discussion and talk about uh, both the writing of this book and the thoughts behind it and the importance of it, uh, I'm, we're, we're very, very lucky to have Melissa to read from the hives. So uh, I, I, I wanna get to that and I wanna, I wanna hear that. So we're gonna move to that as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, Melissa Skulls Young. Uh, thank you, Jared. Thank you to Politics and Prose. Thank you to everyone for being here tonight to celebrate the launch of the hive. Um, it's been a long time coming and I'm honored uh, to bring it really to feel like I'm bringing it home tonight. I, I have roots in the Midwest, but I feel very much planted after a decade here in DC. So it's an honor to launch this book tonight with Politics and Prose. Um, I signed a lot of copies earlier this week, so make sure that you buy from, from your local bookstore. I'm gonna to read to you from the beginning to introduce you to the Feller families, and, and then we can dive into our discussion. Um, this is from the very, very beginning. So I wanna bring you the Feller sisters and, and tell you a little bit about the Feller family fish camp, which is where we begin our story. It was mid-July on a sweltering Missouri afternoon and the sun couldn't find a single cloud to hide behind. Waterfowl ducked beneath the river's surface and whippoorwills sang their melancholy from lush trees waving above. The stale air stank of soil and algae mixed with coconut sunscreen. The muddy water of the Mississippi River wasn't worried with the Feller family's survival, but the sisters were. Sunshine baked the wooden dock and kissed the Feller sisters' freckles. Just as they had the summer before, and the one before that one too, the sisters wore bikinis. Faded tops and bottoms passed down and among them, the river assaulted the elastic and the blistering light faded the floral colors but still the camp's whim were endured. It came too close for me, Tammy said, 
dangling her legs off the dock. We almost lost everything. She flexed her feet in the sticky air, a rotten piece of debris hung from her pinky toe. Tammy shook it off and the current swept it away. Everything that mattered anyway. It was never that close, Maggie insisted. She swatted a mosquito on Tammy's thigh, leaving a thin trail of crimson bug blood. Besides, nobody would want this old fishing camp. It's a mess. But it's our mess, Kate said, looking up and down her row of sisters. It was too close for mom, Jules added. She was itching to be done with it all, the family business and the business of the family, all of it. At least we're still together, Maggie said. That's what dad cared about. Sipping green glass bottles of soda, the sisters agreed, but they'd never know the true feelings of their father. One year ago, they'd sat on this same dock, months before their family broke, and they were left with only the fragments of the hole they'd once been. Now they were making their first camp trip solo as sisters. They were still sorting out who brought what and how the family worked now. Jules dove into the brown water alone and waded her way back up. Maggie and Tammy held hands, nudging each other's hips and jumped off the dock together. Kate ran at her sisters, waited in vain for her parents to call after them, and then belly flopped in the middle of their wake with a splash. The Feller family fish camp had been handed down for three generations, a burden both beloved and neglected. It was a simple single wide trailer on stilts with rusted panels that had maybe once been painted white. The camp sat at the meeting of the Midan Mississippi and the Ohio River on the lap of Fort Defiance Park. Robbie, their dad, liked to remind them all that it was once called Camp Defiance during the Civil War and had been commanded by General Ulysses S. Grant. Jules would roll her eyes and tell him that glorifying a war fought for slavery was oppressive. Before they began bantering about erasing history versus righting historical wrongs, Grace, their mother, would hold up her hand and say, enough. By the time they loaded the car for these trips, Grace had made dozens of decisions. She sought a truce, even if it wouldn't hold. The trailer's living room and kitchen combination reeked of rancid catfish and bitter beer. The two miniature bedrooms housed four sets of built-in beds with narrow strips of peeling, dingy vinyl between the lofts. The fellers ran to camp most summer weekends and squeezed in a few fall trips before the chill arrived and the leaves crisped in the Missouri Valley. At camp, the sisters learned to bait hooks, pull fish mat traps from the muck, and dig burrs out of their bare feet. They knew which bunks were theirs because they'd carved their names in the frame as a tradition on their fifth birthdays. On their annual inaugural trip, as spring rounded the corner to summer, Grace cut notches in the wooden stairs to measure her daughter's growth. She added their initials and the date while the sisters raced ahead, peeling off Catholic school uniforms and pulling on mismatched swimsuit pieces from a communal wicker basket before jumping off the dock into the cool relief of the muddy water. The family dog chased them, cautioning their courage with a bark and cheering on their unleashed animal freedom. The promise of the camp brought hope. It lifted the family spirits to pile in the car after the last day of school and travel toward the water. Each trip, the Feller family wished they would roast marshmallows for s'mores and finally catch fireflies without fighting over which sister had more. They would leave the family pest control business behind and not talk about how to cover the quarterly tax bill or whether they should pay for their employees' cell phones. But first, they had to drive the 46 miles from Cape Girardeau, Missouri to Cairo, Illinois, snaking the Mississippi River's gritty coast to put in the boat. Each trip, Robbie insisted they coordinate bathroom breaks for the drive, but they had to stop at least twice. Even as they grew from children to teens to young adults, their trips were the same. Maggie would say they should have checked the road conditions. Jules got car sick. Someone else would say planning took away from the adventure, probably Tammy. Kate didn't say much. She was lost in her own thoughts and passed around their mom's latest creation of homemade granola bars. Their brindle pit bull nacho would whine from the back seat and lick their hands for crumbs. Robbie promised that if they got all just hold it, they would be cooking hot dogs over a fire in time for supper. But they usually settled for grilled cheese sandwiches on the dock as the sun set. Nacho ran after the bunnies in the bushes, hoping to find his own dinner, relieved to be released from the car. Who knew which family camp trip would be the one they'd remember most? The pieces of the weekends and years might add up to an entirely different story. Maybe they'd each remember separate parts or the same ones in different patterns. Perhaps as grief and joy intersected, they'd learn that the whole mattered more than the portions. Nacho could have told them that. 
Dogs know that the only moment that matters is this one you're living. Thank you so much, Melissa. I'm, I, I love that, um, that opening. And, I, I, and one of the reasons is because, you know, something I really admire about your writing, and I think that this book really brings to the forefront, is we're, we're experiencing like the moment with these characters. We're watching them live in lived in spaces. We have the bunks, we have the fishing camp. We have the traditions, we have all of that. But also, I, I, I feel like right underneath the surface, and this is, I, I, I think you do this as good as anyone and, and probably better than all of them, is there's always these roots underneath the surface uh, of all of it. There's time and there's experience. And um, the word, the, the first time I read this, the word that kept coming to mind for me was inheritance. And I think when we hear the word inheritance, most of the time we think about what money you're going to inherit when someone is gone or what property you're going to inherit. But what, what, what goes on in this book that I think is really compelling and um, inspiring to a certain extent is how it's not just money, property, businesses, it's problems it's traditions, problematic or otherwise. Uh, it's it's um, it's struggles within the family, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it was like to write this book that not only follows these multiple characters within a family and and paints them in, in such a beautiful and at times tragic life, but also to keep in mind the the inherent inheritance of a family, particularly all of these different people who have lived and, and, and moved through this time and, and, and are inheriting these different things from both their family and their, and their cultures? It's a great question. I appreciate you noticing that. Um, you know, you and I talk a lot in, in both of our work about class. And I think class is, it's something we inherit too, right? And so to, to capture the fellers, and those class struggles, and as you mentioned, family problems and family business uh, challenges, I had to really approach each of the family members um, with curiosity, you know, with compassion. Um, I think empathy is, is a kind of writer's superpower. And if we can't create characters that are authentic, but also have flaws on the page, regardless of what they've inherited, um, they won't be compelling, I think, for our readers. Um, I think stories, you know, make us better when we have to think about the things our characters inherit that, um, that contribute to the bags that they bring with us. Um, and many of those bags are family disagreements, right? Um, in the business or in the feller marriage. Um, that, but I wanted to intentionally mirror the debates that we're having as a country, right? About human rights, about healthcare. Um, and I think it's true that you inherit your place, your family, your politics, maybe your religion, um, but it's also true that we question those things. And I think loving a place also means questioning where you're from. Um, I think it's, it's sort of a right time, I hope, for a novel like this because we're living in a politically divided country in this exact moment. And I'm not focusing in the hive on left versus right divisions. I'm, I'm looking more at the rural urban chasm really and, and hoping that stories can you know, heal us and um, give us access maybe to worlds and experiences that we wouldn't you know, spend a lot of time in otherwise. Yeah, and, and you know, I, think, I think good fiction makes us watch and live through characters that maybe they're not making the choices we would make, right? We, we and, and I feel like that's actually one of the things that, that you do best in this piece is, I think that these are living, breathing people who are held by this tradition or inheritance and they, they live in this world. Like, and, and you know, it's, it's on the back of the book. I don't wanna spoil anything for anybody, but the patriarch of this family, the, the owner of the business, um, dies pretty suddenly and that in and of itself has its own it's almost like a tidal pool 
Right. It starts, people feel like they're stuck within it. The characters feel like they're stuck within like sort of the gravity of, of losing him and the gravity of their circumstances. And I think that there's a really wonderful type of empathy that comes from that being able to watch these people who are living lives that maybe we wouldn't live, maybe feeling things that we wouldn't feel, maybe going about their own existences in ways that we wouldn't recognize otherwise. And I think that this book does a really incredible job of presenting us with these multiple lives that are not our own. And it feels in some ways like that is an antidote, not just for polarization, but just basic humanity and empathy. I, I, I feel like that, I feel like it achieves that in, in space. Well, and I'm positive you as a writer feel this too, that writing increases my own humanity, right? Not just through the research, but also through imagining characters that, that are different than me. I'm actually not as interested in, in reading about characters that are like myself. I'm much more interested in characters that, that I have questions about that maybe I don't understand. And, and that leads to a lot of you know, different kinds of research to, to capture them, to understand them, to be able to write them authentically. Um, the Hive has five different women's point of views. Um, and so to capture each of them required a different level of, of work. Um, I wouldn't recommend five point of views ever again. I don't think I want that challenge, but it was, um, it was ambitious for sure. But I, it was the right choice to tell this story, especially as you mentioned with the, with the patriarch dying early in the story. And you're right, it's on the back of the book. We're not giving away spoilers at all. Um, but he has a lot of work to do by leaving the story at the beginning. And, and that really is a type of sudden grief that I think allows each of the women to grow from as, as grief sometimes can. Yeah, and I think that grief, um, and, and it's a complicated grief too. And I, and I, wanna, I wanna make this very clear about the way that this is done because and, and I thought that this was a, a really interesting move here, which is you don't shy away from cultural clashes. You don't shy away from political questions, political differences. Um, this isn't, and, and, and I think this is important to point out for a lot of us who have watched a lot of media coverages in which, I don't know, publications go to a diner in Iowa and just hold a microphone up and ask what people think. Um, we actually see, I think, in this book, a lot of hard discussions and a lot of relationships that are not easy. Uh, they're not always comfortable. Uh, they're having the types of conversations that I think are necessary to have not just a shared society and a working political system, but also a family. Mm -hmm. um, one of the quotes that, that you read earlier, and again, I'm glad that this came out, was at least we're still together. And I think uh, certainly a lot of people who are listening to this or watching this um, possibly in the last few years have had familial strains. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they've had a few moments of, of their family members cutting off communications or deciding it's not worth, you know, necessarily communicating anymore. Can you talk a little bit about what it is to write about familial strain, what it is to navigate these sort of divisive type of ideas, what it is to actually grow, which I think is one of the great strengths of this book, is you see people who are not they're acting realistically, but it does feel like the bonds of family here transcend some of the political polarization that we're talking about. Can you talk about what it was like to write a book in these times about families under strain like this? Hard, yes. <laughs> challenging. Um, but I think that at the core of this family, they share values. They, you know, grit and hard work and, and investing in their community and but what they disagree about are which of the political institutions that will preserve the values, which ones will actually protect the family most. Um, and so there's this tension in the novel, I think in all of our families between the individual and then the family unit and then our larger community unit and then our larger country. And so I wanted those conversations that they have at the dinner table 
Um, and they really do, they get into issues of um, women's rights to their bodies. They get into issues of um, you know, political decisions that affect their family business structure. Um, they talk about race, they talk about tough, tough topics that I think might sometimes be easier to unpack actually in fiction than they actually are at our own dinner table. You know, it's, it's easier in a book club to discuss Jules um, being a first-gen college student who goes off and, and changes her, you know, learns more about the world in a way that expands her political views than it is to talk about, you know, your brother who did the same thing. It's much easier to have these conversations when we can couch them in an imaginary family that may or may not look like our own, but that um, seems a safer place maybe to do so. And I'm hoping that what I'm hoping that's what fiction can do, especially um, as that type of polarization that you're talking about, Jared, relates so much to fear. Um, and, and fear, I think, is really at the heart of what is driving us to not understand each other, right? Um, we hear a lot of extremists on, on both sides, but those folks are pretty noisy and, and most of us are, are pretty much in the center trying to figure out, um, you know, how do we heal from this? Um, and I think we have a natural tendency, and this happens with the characters in the book also, to sort of other um, the people that we disagree with. And I think that's a really dangerous line. And I'm hoping by exposing that line in a, in a story and watching the Feller family wrestle with it, we can you know, have bigger conversations about our own strains as well. Yeah, and I wanna point out, and, and this was something um, I really wanted to hear about because I think it's a fascinating strategy that, that you had in this book. Because again, this book is doing a lot of work. And, and, and I wanna point out, like not only politically, but I mean, it's a really compelling read on top of that. Like, let's not reduce this down into political strategy. Like, this is a this is a barn burner of a of a story that uh, is is entertaining as can be. But you did something that when I first read this book, um, it kind of made me walk around a little bit. You made a distinct choice to set this book during the Obama years. During like, you you turned the clock back to uh to this time period of course and I, and and you know it, it's weird to think about it now but there was of course this moment where um the first african american president of the united states of america uh was was uh, uh this revelatory moment and uh, a lot of people i think that you and i know and love and care about didn't handle the situation uh great at all uh, there was a lot of apocalypticism. There was a lot of conspiracy theories, uh, polarization, which now it's, it's impossible not to connect the dots from where we are mm -hmm. now to that, those activities back then. But I thought it was really kind of a genius move to turn the clock back in this story because it, it's, it's obviously a relevant story right? This is about our times. But you went ahead and turned the clock back a few years. What, what do you think was gained by that? What do you think that did? Because I, I, I think it's a really fascinating decision that you made. Uh, it, it, decision is the exact right word. Uh, I think it was a risky move, but I, I was compelled to set the story in 2008 because I wanted to talk about the recession specifically in middle America. Um, this growing fear, resentment, uh, blaming on Obama. I think, as, as you said, Jared, it absolutely laid the foundation for an election eight years later that seemed to surprise people and did not surprise you and I at all. Um, and I think it, it, it led to a lot of the radicalization that, that we see today. Um, and I think to understand where we are in this political moment, we have to go backwards. Um, you know, Robbie, the patriarch, is the most problematic member of the hive. He longs for a past that, that just um, isn't true, <laughs> um, that really only served a, a certain population. And so his sudden death makes, makes room for the five women to um, figure it out on their own and, and come to their own conclusions about the place that they want in the family business, the place that they want in the world, the place they want in the family. Um, I think it's also a really a look at how small businesses in America are struggling not just through the recession, but also now in 2021. Um, they're trying to stay alive during the pandemic. And I, I, I grew up in a family business, so I see a lot of those tensions. Um, and family businesses, they're the backbone of this country. Um, you know, 
99% of all businesses in the US are, are, are uh, small businesses. And yet I also see that uh, the pandemic has, has greatly affected small businesses. And, and I see that tension, I see that struggle. Um, and and I, I really wanna talk about that in fiction, but in a way that's digestible, in a way that we can talk about the Feller family when we may not be able to talk about our own. Um, and, and I'm still, you know, family businesses in this country are still struggling to come back. And I can understand their frustration and resentment, um, especially in 2021, more than 70% of them had to shut their doors last year in order to contain the virus. And that is uh, destabilizing to any family, especially to a family business. Um, and there's not really a way to separate in a family from the family business. Those, those things are all at your dinner table. Um, and, there, and there's not much you can actually, um, there's not much of a, an authentic line that you can draw. Yeah, and you know, I, you know, just go ahead and, and lay my own cards on the table. I think one of the reasons that you and I have bonded is because like you were saying, we saw this happen. We watched it occur, unfortunately, in a really tragic way. And I will say that if this book did take place in a 2020 or a 2019 or even a 2016, um, the people I know and love are drowning in QAnon. Mm -hmm. They're, uh, you know, they're on social media believing wild conspiracy theories, um, talking about, uh, you know, a, a political rivals as if they're part of some sort of a satanic cabal. And if the next election is lost or if, if uh, you know, if violence isn't undertaken, like we're talking about evil conspiracies. And at that point, the conversation, it's hard to get that conversation back on line, right? But I think one of the things that you did in this book, I think that um, is good, not just for empathy, but also to start putting people into these perspectives to understand what is happening in these places is you have the character of grace and grace. Uh, I, I actually honestly believe that grace is like one of the best modern characters of literary fiction. I think it, I, I think grace is an achievement. Um, this is a frustrated wife who finds herself um, adrift in the world uh, is trying to find herself and one of the ways that she finds, I don't know if agency is the right word, but yeah. grasps for agency is within the apocalyptic prepping community. We have, we have a character, a, a, a matriarch, I guess we would go ahead and say, who starts training for the downfall of society, the possibility of uh, some sort of an apocalyptic event, searching for some kind of control in her life. Um, and, and by the way, for anyone who doesn't know this, this is one of the best tidbits of the entire uh, book and experience is that uh, Melissa, who is nothing if not a, a valid researcher, decided to go ahead and attend prepper camp herself to see what this was all about, um, which we could talk about for an hour or one, but we'll, we'll go ahead and spare people the, uh, the ins and outs of that. I don't know. They want to know about prepper camp. It sounds, prepper like, camp I'm, is... sounds like I'm making it up and I'm not. But I, it's not. I, no. I mean, no, not... it's real and it's, it's worthwhile. And you're right. I went there as research and I was very clear going into it that I was going there as a researcher. I told the organizers I was there as a researcher. I told them I'm not a journalist, but I have questions and, and I'm, I didn't mean to write such a timely book. Um, prepping is pretty mainstream these days. And um, it, it doesn't, especially coming, you know, at, at, uh, in, in the middle of a pandemic, it, it doesn't actually <laughs> seem quite so extreme to make sure you have enough food and water and things in your house to actually sustain your family for a while. Um, so I did, I went to prepper camp. It's, um, you can go too, Jared, anyone listening can go to prepper camp. It's happening again this fall. It's a three-day wilderness skill building workshop in North Carolina. Um, and, I, and I wanted to know for Grace particularly what that line was between preparedness, right? And, and, and paranoia. And she gets very caught up in thinking that this will be the answers. Um, and she wants to save her family. She wants to protect her daughters. What parent doesn't? The question is, you know, where do you put those resources and, and what are you willing to do in order to other someone else and protect your own? That's a big question I think that we are facing a great deal 
in a country where we're trying to figure out individualism versus community. Um, we're, we're struggling with that. And it, it made sense to me to watch Grace do the same. Yeah, and it's, it's this strange dance that feels so terribly relevant, which is, I mean, you, you can have conversations with some people talking about destroying democracy. I don't know, carrying out an attempted coup at the capital of the United States of America, um, overthrowing elections. And to hear people talk about it, a lot of the time it is, it's, it, 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 they talk about doing it for their kids. If my kids are going to have a country, I have to do it to take back the country, those types of things. What was it like to step into that mindset and see it blossom? Because I feel like, and, and actually I'm gonna go ahead and, and rope in one of the, the questions we have here, which is from Stephanie Grant. Um, Stephanie says, I admire your courage in writing explicitly political conversations. It's really tricky. How did you avoid making those political conversations heavy handed? Mm -hmm. And I wanna say, you are not heavy handed in this book at all. You give your characters a lot of line. You let them go, you, you, you let them be organic, you let them be real. Grace goes to this prepper camp and is fully ready for some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. what, what is it like to step into the mindset of these people? And, and what did you maybe learn from crafting these stories of these people? I think sometimes in fiction, we write the world the way we want it to be. And, and that's a bit of a gift to our readers, to ourselves. And so when the feller women are sitting around and having conversations, um, you know, when Robbie, the father is in the picture and when he's not in the picture, um, they're messy conversations. They aren't easy ones to sit through. Um, and, and some of them are power struggles as well. Um, and I, I want those conversations to be believable. Uh, I'm not interested in actually writing or even reading about perfect people. I don't even believe them. I don't believe they exist. And so I, I very much want fiction to tell that truth. Um, and prepper camps absolutely surprised me. I thought it was going to be one way. I thought it was going to be a pretty, um, a gun show based on consumerism, which is a lot of what we hear about the doomsday preppers. If you've ever seen those shows, the people I was with at prepper camp think those shows are ridiculous. Um, and they think it's just a show, right? And, and so it was much more of a, 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 of a hippie back to nature type of survivalism and self-sustainability that, that I reckoned with, that I grew up with. I grew up on you know, a dirt road in rural Missouri where we grew our food and, and always had animals and, and, and got our own eggs. And you know, we knew how to take care of ourselves. And so I related to the preppers who, one of the workshops, we learned what we could eat in the forest. We learned about solar energy and composting, these types of skills that I think we tend to think are more liberal um, or progressive, but Grace wants to live in, in conjunction with the land. And she believes that there are threats that don't actually exist. And that's part of what Grace's awakening has to be about, of, of figuring out where the threats really are in her family, in her country, and versus the ones that she is being told by certain news programs in, in terrible sound bites, that those are the threats you should worry about. Grace has to really realize that she's dehumanizing, that she's crossed kind of a dangerous line. Um, and, and I think that's something that we all get into when we discuss politics. We're really pretty decent at assuming all people who are this way all believe this thing rather than having nuanced conversations that we absolutely need to have. I don't think we're doing a great job of listening to each other. Um, I think we are wanting quick, easy fixes that just don't exist because the, comp, you know, the, the, the answers are complicated. But I think if we can get to the values, then, then we find more of what's in common, right? So um, I may want to preserve the land and, be, and, and, and have policies that protect the environment. A hunter does too. Someone who goes out and hunts the land very much wants to preserve the land also. And so if we can talk about the values and the things that are, are more foundational, I think we might have more productive conversations. Um, but that requires slow conversations. And you and I both as, as professors know that that's a difficult thing to, to train anyone in a classroom to do, even outside of the classroom, to have those slow, productive, hard conversations where everyone is safe. Um, that's the challenge, right? Well, I'm so glad you said it that way, because 
I personally, uh, in, in my own role in, in politics, I, I am always very wary of easy answers. Easy answers are almost always wrong, misleading answers. And when you actually start to scratch underneath the surface, you realize nuance is king. And there, there is just particularly political crises, which is what we're dealing with here. I mean, this is set during a political crisis that is leading to more political crises. Conversations, trusting one another, solidarity, working through it, uh, through comparing notes and like being there for each other and trusting each other. But meanwhile, like you said, the, the news bites on certain networks, uh, I, I, I would call them loud voices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think you and I have both had our fair share of ha having to hear loud voices over TV networks, uh, a certain loud voice uh, over the radio who, uh, you know, is sort of a, a background figure in all of this. Like there are occasionally moments in this book where that sort of stuff will come in almost like a voice from the distance. But I think what makes this book capable of doing what it does and what makes the characters able to be who they are, and this gives us not necessarily solutions, but the beginnings of solutions, which are almost as important as solutions themselves, is the fact that, that those voices, maybe they're out there, but they don't win out. It's the relationships, it's the trust, it's the solidarity. It feels like that is a, that's a really important point here. And I'm more interested in the questions and the conversation. I, I don't pretend that I have answers at all, but I think the conversations are more important. Um, and I think that's actually part of what's really damaging about how we talk about politics is that we're quick to get to an answer, as you said, Jared, that's usually wrong, um, that isn't nuanced. And rather than really unpacking the issue and hearing from folks who are directly involved in the impact of the issue, right? And so I'm not as interested and don't pretend that I have answers, but I do think that fiction and stories and watching families struggle like the fellers might you know, just open up the conversations a little bit more. Um, but we are trained, especially in media, to get to a quick answer and, and the loudest one is supposed to win. And, and I think that's a detriment to all of us. But you know, we get the media we deserve. If you don't like it, talk back to it. Don't participate in it. Turn off the TV. There's plenty, plenty of options for media that, that speak to the slow conversation. Um, you know, I, I tune in every week, Jared, to, to your bourbon talk, to your podcast, to, to the muckrake, because I, I want to hear slow conversations. I want to hear people take apart issues, say they don't have all the answers, um, and, and really wrestle uh, with, with what's real. Not to plug your show, Jared, but um, well, I was going to say, what a hat tip for product placement. <laughs> that's that's exactly what needed to happen in that answer. Well, I, I think I mean part of the reason you know you and I talk so much is that I am seeking out like-minded people with similar experiences, but that may come to different conclusions, and and that exposure matters so much, right? When I talk about the rural-urban divide, I I think what what I mean is that you can be just as insulated in a suburb of DC in your thinking as you can be worldly on a, on a dirt road in rural Missouri. It's a matter of how you respond to difference, whether or not you shut out difference because it seems like a threat, or whether you get really curious about it, really open up and, and have more compassion for it and have empathy. And that doesn't mean you have to have an answer. It means that maybe you need to be better at listening. And so part of what, what the struggle in the Feller family is, is, is trying to have conversations with a family in which people have different capacities for those conversations, right? That it, it takes a long time to learn how to do that in a classroom. It takes a long time to learn how to do that in a family, to slow it down and to have the family members feel safe enough to, to make mistakes, uh, to have errors. Um, each of the feller women struggles with very, very different issues, um, but they're not, um, they are supported in those struggles, right? It's not, um, it's not hard for the family foundation to remain strong. Um, so like I said, maybe, maybe we write the worlds that you know, we want to live in. Um, but I also think that fiction and family stories, right? Novelists, I think, come to family stories because we're, you know, we're raised and shaped by our worldviews. And I think there's plenty of peace and conflict in our own walls. And I think it's just as fascinating and as epic what happens to the Feller family as it is you know, outside the world of our nuclear. Um, there's plenty of... of um, great wars to unpack inside those walls too. 
Well, I want to say, and I think this is a, an achievement you should be congratulated for. This book is not easy in that way. Like you said, it's, it's not offering answers, but I do feel like it's opening the door towards self-exploration, um, towards uh, reflection, towards the, the type of things that, that we need. I, I would say it's rewarding. I would say it's haunting. I, would, I, you know, I walked around for a little while after I first read this book and I felt like I was getting a reflection of reality, but I was also getting a dose of actual reality. And, and, and that is, uh, to go back to the question, of course, of, of like, you know, the heavy handedness, I feel like you, you found something really, really important, but also organic. And I think that that is something uh, people should know is that this thing is, uh, is, is uh, really important that way. I, I will say, uh, we got some questions here that I want to open it up to. Okay. Um, but I just want to say it's also, it's also funny, Jared. Oh, it's very, no, you're very funny. Funny. That's the and, and and congrats on that. Is your ability to make the Feller, the Feller family? Um, they yeah. have a lot of fun together, and they really did crack me up writing them. Um, they kept surprising me, and you know, in a first draft, you get some of those great surprises, um, and then you know, in the second draft, in your twenty eighth draft, it's your job to to make them intentional. But they were. Um, go ahead, Jared. You were going to. Well, I would. I would just say, if I had to describe them, I would say they are a hoot and a holler. That's <laughs> what it is. Like we're we're talking right about, on the jacket, right on the back of the jacket, right there. I'm going to write we're it. We're talking it about serious, somber things, <laughs> but they are a joy to be around. And it seems I. I don't know. How do you feel about that? And I, I'll go ahead and I'll wrap in one of the questions that we've we've got. Uh, which was from uh, Jamie Vaughn, which is which character's point of view is the most difficult for you to write and why? I would also ask what character was the most fun to write? Because again, like we're talking about like really serious stuff here, but this this novel is also incredibly enjoyable. Uh, most difficult to write was probably actually Maggie, um, who's the oldest daughter who takes over tries to save the family business. Um, she was the character I, I felt that I had the least amount of access to um, because she is so singularly focused and um, she seems almost the least ambitious, but it's because she's, you know, we often define ambition as, as something that's other, outside our hometown, outside of our family, outside of our family business. But Maggie is taking her talents and investing them. And I think valuing her community in that way is something we dismiss sometimes in literature. We have this idea that, you know, whoever leaves uh, our hometowns is the, is the ambitious one and, and they have a way out versus thinking about folks who stay in our hometowns and stay in our businesses is the ones who actually have the courage to make them better. And so Maggie um, was more challenging to write. Grace was, definitely a hoot to write um, because she is she's so ambivalent about motherhood and that is just not the way mothers are supposed to be and yet I found her to be the most true um, she she definitely wrestles with motherhood and her own identity she had uh, babies when she was 18 years old and that has complicated her own feelings about herself and her own frustrations in the world um, so, so Grace was a lot of fun to write, um, but I mean, each of them really did surprise me in a different way. My heart's with Jules. Jules is the one who breaks my heart. She's the first generation college student and she is an absolute, um, she's a mess in some ways and she's really finding herself in others. And she goes to college and, and struggles with mental illness and, and then falls in love. Um, and so she's struggling with all of these different wonderful things you do when you're out on your own for the first time, but she needs support and, and she gets that. And, and that to me as a, as a writer is a gift to give a character. Um, but they all, they all cracked me up. Um, Kate, the baby of the family just watches everyone else. Um, and she's a lot of fun too, but I think Tammy sometimes steals the show, our pageant queen. Um, she's a force of nature. <laughs> she is. I yeah. loved that, that character. Um, and, and I had written the character of Tammy in several other books that I'm working on and she just kept coming back to the hive. She would just not, she insisted that she was going to be in there. And so, um, she actually, I think provides a lot of the comic relief. Um, but in many ways, I think she really is that portrait of, 
of feminism rising from rural roots because she's coming, she's coming of age and she's coming into her own in the story through some, you know, through some bad choices. And, and she really flips the narrative of, of what happens when you, you make some bad choices. Is that the rest of your life or can, can you start over again, right? Can you redefine what that success is going to look like? And so she really is the one who pushes back against the town also and, and some of those conventions that are supposed to say, um, young women should do this, young women should do this, they should act like this. Tammy's the one I think who disrupts those notions. So they were all a lot of fun to write, I gotta be honest. No, they're they're a good time. I uh, I, I I miss them. I missed them after I, I quit reading the book. I have to tell you, I've missed them quite a bit. Melissa, uh, Laura Zam has a question that I'm wondering as well, and I just I can't wait to uh, to to hear the answer. Why an exterminating business? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, bugs are fascinating, and and pollinators in particular, we need them, right? Like, but we have to figure out ways to. Oh, okay. We are disgusted by bugs. I, I opened my window earlier to, to let Jared hear, but anyone who's tuning in from Washington, D.C., you can't actually hear outside of our window for the cicadas right now. And people are really, really upset about the cicadas. They feel like it's personal. Um, they can't walk outside without getting just dive bombed by these cicadas. I am shoveling feet worth of cicada debris. We do not like bugs, but Bugs are so incredibly fascinating. Our disgust of them is fascinating. And I, I often feel like our disgust of them is also class-based. We do not want bugs in our house, but we do not want to know whose job it is to get the bugs out of our house, right? That's a skilled labor position that we would rather not know about. Uh, we don't wanna know what it takes to get insects out of our food supplies. We are completely grossed out. In fact, my agent tells me not to have this conversation. Here I am having it, politics and pros. Uh, because people feel so very, very strongly about bugs. But I mean, family businesses are the backbone of this country and, and many of them are skilled labor, are, are you know, service industry jobs that, that we don't really want to kind of know exist. Um, so I thought, I don't know, when you grow up, I grew up in a bug business. My family's in the exterminating business. My dad, you know, is the, was the termite technician, you know, and, and I grew up learning how to count glue boards and, uh, cleaning B&Gs and cleaning offices. And that seemed very normal to me. And then of course you go out in the world and you realize that it's not normal. <laughs> but we all, we all think our own families are normal until the fellers start you know, interacting with others. And this is not in any way my family's bug business story. Um, you know, my, I, I have a bunch of brothers and, and this is uh, an entire um, army of sisters sorting out secession among them, which which is complicated, right? Because there isn't a brother in the mix. There isn't a male heir as, as there is supposed to be in many family businesses. Um, and so they've got to wrestle with those outdated notions. But I don't know, why not bugs? Um, I think they're a really ripe metaphor, to be very honest with you. And bed bugs in particular, because they don't know class, right? The, the higher your class socioeconomic structure, the, the more likely you are to um, invite them into your life. I've said too much. I've said I feel like much. I just learned so much about the bug industry and I'm, <laughs> I'm here for it. Um, I have a question here from uh, Kathleen Wheaton. And I just want to say, so the, the question here is about Robbie, the, the patriarch of uh, the fellers, who, um, again, not to spoil anything, but of course we have this uh, surprise uh, uh, death of, of Robbie. Uh, He's not in a lot of this book, but just a, a huge, huge character and memorable. Um, Kathleen says, it's interesting that we only ever see Robbie externally. Did you always know that you would not include his point of view? Yes, Kathleen, I always knew I was not going to include his point of view. It's not his story to tell. And I got to be honest, I've, I've read a lot of, of stories from, from his point of view, and I'm looking for stories that are from other points of view. Um, I, and, and the five women in the story each get their own point of view, and it's, it's a close third to each of them. The narrator, of course, is consistent throughout, but each of the voices in um, the women's point of view are very, very different. And sometimes when I approached a scene, like the funeral scene, for example, I had to figure out whose story it was and which point of view gave us the most access. So this is something we talk about in fiction workshops all the time. Like who is it that, whose story is it to tell? What is their intention in telling it? 
but who actually can give us the, the, the more round picture of the scene? And so several times I had to rewrite a scene from a different point of view in order to figure out which point of view it was going to be. Um, but I, I never considered writing it from Robbie's. We get a lot of Robbie's story that are, that's told through the women, but he had to, even as beloved and complicated as he was, he had to exit the scene in order for that sudden grief to launch the story. And, and I think that's what's complicated about grief sometimes is the way that we do grow from it. Um, and that's, that's, that's a complicated thing. And not, that uh, it's a, not that it's a welcome grief in any way, but that it isn't, um, that sometimes an end is also a beginning. Well, it's complicated, right? Because if Robbie's around, they might find themselves, but Robbie is a gravity that would have fought against that to a certain extent, I think. He's not a character that's interested in any type of shift in power dynamics at all. And, and, and you know, another character, Brian, his, uh, their cousin comes into the picture um, and, and he's a very different type of man. He's more interested in the cooperation of the hive and he's more interested in, in, in participating in it and, and seeing how that the family structure can benefit each individual rather than uh, revolve around one power dynamic. Um, so, um, there are plenty of point of views that, that I could have chosen, but I, I really feel like this is a story that's about the feller family women. I agree with that. Leslie is wondering what other political novels or novels about class do you admire? And I'll just go ahead and uh, throw this in there. Do you feel like there are books that you're in conversation with here? Do you feel like you're, uh, you're building off of other things? What, what, where do you, where'd you come at this from? Oh, that's a great question, especially as I'm sitting here um, in my office. Um, one of the books I really admire, a, a big epic novel, uh, and there's so many, and this was out a few years ago, Silver Girl by Leslie Petrick is a novel that I really admired uh, for its also struggle with, with first gen, with, with poverty, with class. Um, it's set in the Midwest also, it's set in Chicago, near Chicago. And, and that's, it's a book that I feel like this was a bit in conversation with. Um, and you know, feminism is not a term that is embraced in rural culture, but the absolute ideas behind feminism and the values are, are the same, but the term itself is problematic. And one of the things I admire sometimes in, in epic novels that are about the Midwest is, is, um, is the way that that term is sort of danced around. And I don't care what we call it, um, I know what it is. <laughs> and so uh, we get caught up a lot in those labels that I think that that discussion actually doesn't serve us very well. So there are so many books that, that I think that this is in conversation with. Um, I was actually reading a lot more nonfiction when I was writing it. I tend to read in the opposite genre that I'm writing it. Um, so now I'm writing nonfiction. And so I'm, I'm diving into delicious novels all summer. Um, and there's a lot of them that are out this summer. Um, I have stacks and stacks, Jared, of, of reading recommendations. Um, there's a ton of short story collections right now that I think that are out that are, can I just grab a pile? I, just, I, I, I think we would love that. Would you really? I just happen to have a pile of short story collections that I would highly recommend. Some of these are out already. Some of them are, can you see that, Jared? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are short story collections I just finished either reviewing or, or actually um, reading. And, Here's a pile of novels I currently absolutely love. I'm look, I'm just throwing them up at the Mary Jane uh, by Jess Kanye Blue just came out. And then of course in nonfiction, I have I have this pile, Jared. I don't know if you recognize any. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you recognize. This is egregious. <laughs> this is egregious. You know what? I will say this one, which you know is my favorite book of yours. Um, I think there's too much light on it. It's the man they wanted me to be, toxic masculinity and a crisis of our own making. This is years ago for you. I know this is not what you're writing right now, but this book, um, I think is a book that everybody needs to read. It really gives a different level of access to what it means to be a man in this country. And um, I think it's a book that everyone should read. I loved it when it came out. Um, I admired you through your work long before we became friends, um, but that's a book that I teach again and again. So there's, I mean, my office is piled with, that's a great, fantastic part about being a writer is that you get to live in a world of books and it's it's an incredible honor just to be able to play the game right that that for a living I get to read books and talk to students about their work and and read DC women writers and 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 have literary friends it's it's overwhelming to have become this fortunate 
But I will say also that a lot of stories that are about the Midwest or stories that are about rural communities and cultures don't get the same traffic in academia. They don't get the same scholarship. Sometimes those stories I think are, and you know this from working at a university as well, that these voices are, are much more rare in, in, um, in the academy. It's, it's, it's a part of the problem is, is what it is. I, I think it is part of the problem. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm here to, I'm here to try to fix that. And I, I think that I think that you have uh, you have contributed to the solution to that problem with the eye for sure. Um, with that, I I'm, you you sort of answered this uh, question uh, really really quickly. We have just a couple of minutes. Uh, Monica Hogan has asked, "Are you working on another novel? And if so, is it also set in the Midwest?" Um, you just said that you're working on a nonfiction project. Would you would you like to talk a little bit about that very quickly? I, I have another novel it's called Restoration, and it's um, also about um, what we talked a little bit about, this struggle between individualism and community, like what we care enough about, value enough to preserve. And so I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of restoration, like what do we tear down versus what do we invest in? Um, that novel also has uh, a dog park in it because I'm also fascinated by the culture of rescue communities. <laughs> Uh, so that I'm having a, a really good time writing that one. But really what I'm working on is uh, what I'm calling working dispatches from the working class. And these are narrative nonfiction reflections on feminist working class coming of age really in middle America. And the, um, the very first essay from it, I just published with Lit Hub and it's about the, the love and the burden of a family business and, and what it means to rural identities. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, generational knowledge and wealth that's passed on when you're born into a family business. And um, and I'm wrestling with with how you also sort out secession in a family business. Um, so that essay is in Lit Hub, and that's actually the beginning of the next book. So if folks are interested, they, they can read it there. Um, very, very quickly, because we just have a couple of leftover minutes, uh, Cassandra had asked uh, for a novel that has so many personal ties. Now we're talking about the difference between fiction and nonfiction. Can you talk very, very quickly about the need to distance yourself from these things? What, what it's like to deal with this sort of autobiographical information? Um, you don't tell a story that's not yours to tell. Um, I think you have to, um, and, and you imagine a world the way that maybe you want it to be. Um, so this is not autobiographical, except that I grew up in a family business. That's about, that's about uh, all that we get. That's mine. Um, but I don't know. I think you have to be very careful <laughs> um, and very cautious and very empathetic. I think it's important. And if you can't approach a subject or, or a struggle with compassion, if, if you're drawing from your own life, I, I would stay away from it. I think it's probably not um, something that needs to be on the page right now. Well, I just want to say thank you, Melissa, uh, for this. And before we go, I just want to tell everybody, The Hive is seriously one of the best novels in a very long time, and not just for the political message and, uh, and the contents, but the writing is just damn good. This, is, this is a real achievement, Melissa. Congratulations. Thank you, Jared. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, this means a lot. And especially to buy books local at Politics and Prose um, and to buy them at your local bookstore. Um, it means a lot. Thank you, Jared. Thanks. And we here at Politics and Prose really want to send our sincere thanks to Melissa Skulls Young, Jared Yates Sexton, the Washington Literacy Center, and of course to our audience out there. Please make sure to check your inbox for that coupon promotion from the Shoe Hive in Alexandria. Um, your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this type of important programming, and we wouldn't be able to do it without the book sales to support it. So please follow the link in the chat to purchase your copy of The Hive or just visit politics-prose.com. And while you're there, you can check out our events calendar for everything else coming up in June and beyond. And from our shelves to yours, we hope you're out there staying safe, staying strong, and of course, staying well-read. We will see you next time. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Jared.